I'm Larry Ray, President and CEO of American Manganese, Inc. Listed on the TSX Venture, ticker symbol AMY, A-M-Y, with proprietary patents in the U.S., China, and South Africa. Our focus is on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. China recently legislated the responsibility for recycling onto their electric vehicle manufacturers and importers. For more information, please visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Ted Dixon, CEO and co-founder of InkResearch.ca, Canada's first online financial news and research service. Welcome to the show, Ted. It's great to be back, Jim. You had a very interesting solution to the Vancouver real estate I don't know if it's a bubble, what you call it when it's something like this. I call it a feeding frenzy. Is that well, an accurate feed, way to describe it? Is it isn't a feeding frenzy. I think that's a pretty uh, uh, good characterization. But, I mean, I don't think there is a, a silver bullet solution uh, to the situation. What, uh, what we're, the state we're at, though, is that it's it certainly um, now uh, long past the, the point where the, the, the horse, you know, is in the barn, the horse is well down the road, and we're not going to be able to uh, get the horse even back into, you know, into the into the pasture here without all three levels of government uh, coming together and, um, and and tackling the issue. And unfortunately, there just doesn't seem to be any... Uh, any move in that direction, you know, you've got the, the feds doing uh, a little bit on market rules. You've got the province doing a little bit on uh, shadow flipping. Um, you got the, uh, I don't know, I don't, I don't think you've got anything really meaningful going on at the municipal level. So, you know, it, 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 I, it's just going to have to let nature take its course here, I think, and eventually uh, um, market forces uh, will um, prevail. But that uh, when that will be, it uh, could take a long time. And now. You know, I hear time. I hear over and over again that it's, uh, it, you know, it's all because there's a lack of supply, and then mortgage rates, rates don't really matter, and it's all about supply. If only we were, you know, if only we could build more condo towers, and you know, uh, everything would be great. Well, you know, I think that uh, what we see in Hong Kong is uh, a case where once monetary policy tightens, things cool off, and until we get uh, a more realistic monetary policy in Canada. That's not at crisis levels, um, which which was, were set uh, a long time ago, and which have remained at crisis levels for years, that almost almost a decade now. Um, until we get normal monetary policy, you know, the, this feeding frenzy will likely continue. Well, in Hong Kong, sales are down thirteen percent since last September, and sales are down twenty five percent. Is that going to happen to Vancouver sooner or later? Uh, you know, I don't know what's going to happen to Vancouver sooner or later, and you know, it could it could keep on going for a generation and uh, become a ghost town in terms of economic vibrancy, because you can't possibly run a business, uh, you know, a world class business, and attract world class talent. Uh, of these home prices. I mean, business cannot afford to pay people half a million dollars to be a project manager. But, you know, to own a decent house in Vancouver now, you really need about a half a million dollar family income. So, you know, and I mean Vancouver, the city of Vancouver. So the um, likelihood of uh, Vancouver gaining any economic uh, vitality uh, in terms of uh, new, new global-scale businesses, and to compete, you're going to have to be a global-scale business. Is pretty low, you know. So uh, the outlook for uh, even people who come here, uh, who have money uh, to set up a family, uh, I'm, you know, uh, be prepared. Your your kids are going to have to probably go elsewhere to to find a job, you know, unless they, you know, they're not looking for anything that pays, you know, more than a, you know, a, a, you know, a, few, a little bit above minimum wage. But uh, Vancouver businesses are going to be driven out and. Uh, how long this process takes, though, you know, it could be a generation. Well, I mean, a study found that after paying their mortgage or rent, if you live in any other major city in Canada, you've got anywhere from twenty-three to forty-six thousand dollars of disposable income. In the city of Vancouver, it's minus three thousand dollars. No, and 
you know, to me, I'm not aware of that study, Jim, but uh, anecdotally, you know, I find I, I can I can swallow those numbers. I, I, I it wouldn't surprise me. I think there's a lot of home equity withdrawals that are going on in, to keep uh, the economy going here. Uh, you know, and I think you do have a number of wealthy uh, um, players that have moved into the market, the real estate market, and uh, you know are profiting from it. And then, and, and you know, their their spending is certainly helping things. But for the vast majority of economic activity, I think it's being boosted by uh, a, 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 you know, appreciating property values. But, you know, this cannot go on forever. I mean, you you know, it will not go on forever. And I know there's people who are probably listening to this show who believe it can. I mean, I hear it on the radio when I'm you know driving around that now the only way to make money in, uh, is uh, through the real estate market. Well, that is not the way you generate wealth. You generate wealth by creating products and goods and services that people need around the world or locally. Sure, you know, you, you, there is a there is a a uh, need for local products as well, but you know, in terms of real estate, it, it's not a scalable type of activity uh, that you can sell broadly. You know, if you have, there's only so many homes you can own. There's only you know to flip, and there's only so many you know a, apartment blocks you can own. You know, and at a, a, a two or three percent return of investment rate, uh, which is you know kind of what the cap rate is now. Uh, you can only make so much money doing that. So uh, there's a there's a lot of assumptions that this is going to keep going on forever, and maybe it will keep going on for a generation. But I think that was that's kind of the best case scenario. Eventually, uh, interest rates will move back up. I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon, especially given the current crew we have running the Bank of Canada. But uh, eventually, market forces, uh, whether it's through higher rates or just through a lack of demand, will dampen Vancouver, uh, the Vancouver housing market. And when that happens, this home equity withdrawal phenomenon will stop and the economy will stop. And this will be a day of reckoning. When it happens, I don't know. I mean, it sounds like I'm, I'm kind of painting a doomsday scenario here. It's not really doomsday. It's just going to be a... Um, a flat, uh, you know, flop. <laughs> well, what you're describing flop. actually is what is the way the city of London is. I mean, Westminster, that's your, your heart of London. It only has 5,000 permanent residents because the only people who can afford to live in central London are billionaires and people on welfare because the government there will pay your rent or mortgage rather than putting you in social housing because it's cheaper to do that. That's who... Well, you know, is that the fate of Vancouver? And that's the model. And that's the model. Let's face it. That's the model. Um, policymakers have either uh, consciously or unconsciously accepted for Vancouver, and it's going to have huge repercussions over, especially if this can, carries on for a generation. If you know, if you're happy with that model, then you just uh, let things ride and hope it keeps on going forever. But if you're, but if you're, um, if you think that there's another way of uh, of building the city, then you want this adjustment to happen sooner rather than later. You know, I'm sure uh, no politician wants an adjustment to, to happen on their watch, and uh, this is a, not just a, a phenomenon of, of local politicians, but it's everywhere around the world. You never see politicians anywhere around the world tackling the housing market. What's happening in Hong Kong, because they're pegged to the U.S. dollar, the, the, what's going on with the Federal Reserve and their, and their uh, tightening of monetary policy, it's hitting the Hong Kong real estate market. So that is why Hong Kong. One reason why Hong Kong is adjusting. You've had some, you had some pullback in Chinese economic activity, but they're on the throttle again in boosting money supply, and some of that money supply is hitting the shores of Vancouver real estate. So, you know, I don't expect uh, any any uh, uh, monetary policy solution for the Vancouver market. It's going to be through other forces, and when and how that evolves is not predictable but it will eventually it will, will eventually take place and uh, a monetary policy slowdown in china or a slowdown in demand of uh for housing in china could be one of the catalysts but we will have to see 
We'll have more with Ted Dixon right after the break. I'm Larry Ray, President and CEO of American Manganese, Inc. Listed on the TSX Venture, ticker symbol AMY, A-M-Y, with proprietary patents in the U.S., China, and South Africa. Our focus is on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. China recently legislated the responsibility for recycling onto their electric vehicle manufacturers and importers. For more information, please visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 7 7-8-5-7-4-4-4-4-4-4. Welcome back. We're speaking with Ted Dixon. The Canadian dollar lost half a cent today because there are fears the U.S. Fed will raise interest rates at some time this year. Are they going to? Do you think? Well, what's in, what's interesting uh, tomorrow? Uh, tomorrow on uh, Friday, May twentieth, we're rebalancing the Canadian Cider Index. Now, this is an index of fifty growth and value stocks preferred by insiders on the Toronto Stock Exchange. And every, every six months, we uh, rerun the, uh, the the filter screens. It's all a quantitative process. And um, those that make the screen stay and those that uh, don't fall out, we put them in with higher ranking stocks. And interestingly enough, on this rebalancing, we've got a big tilt towards gold mining companies and mining companies. Now, why would that be? Well, uh, insiders are are getting behind the notion that there's so much uncertainty with central bank policy that gold and commodities will probably find a home if for no other reason, you know, with investors, home with investors, if for no other reason as a, as a diversifier and a sense of insurance and security in an uncertain period. We do not know, uh, how this is all going to work out with the Fed and other central banks. Yes, the Fed is threatening to raise rates. How that would work out is anybody's guess. All we know is that when the ECB tried, did raise rates uh, a few years ago, it didn't work out so well, and now they're in negative rates. When the Swedish central bank tried to raise rates, that didn't work out so well for them, and they're in negative rates. So, you know, I think... Uh, in one sense, you say to the Fed, "Okay, go have a ball. You know, go raise your rates and see what happens." And uh, I, that's why, even as the rates go up, I wouldn't surprise me to see gold uh, surprise a few people and hold a bid, even though you're going to have kind of the knee-jerk uh, Wall Street pundits out there saying, "Sell gold because it doesn't have uh, a dividend. It's a relic. You know, buy your U.S. Treasury bills that'll now be yielding half a percent." And because it's so much better than gold. Well, uh, if every, if the policymakers really had a grip on things and it was pretty clear how this was all going to end, I would say, you know, the gold bears may have a point, but there is no clear policy path or policy outcome. The Fed wants to raise rates. There's a good chance the U.S. is already in recession. There's a good chance it's not. But why would you be raising rates? When you're on such shaky ground, they're raising rates because they want to show the world they can. Well, uh, Jean-Claude uh, Trichet did that in Europe, and look what happened. And they did that in Sweden. Look what happened. We will see. We will see how this all ends up. But until there's more clarity in terms of how this is all going to end up, you know, gold will have a bit of a bid. And, you know, for those who believe that uh, uh, the only way to go uh, in terms of making money in uh, the local economy in Vancouver is to buy real estate, I would suggest that, uh, you know, to remember the old, um, uh, you know, uh, axiom in, um, in the market that uh, just because something worked in the past doesn't mean it's going to work in the future. Right, and part of the the future, I keep hearing more and more about the virtual reality experience when you're using those uh, 3D goggles. Well, now they have entire body suits and gloves, so if you're in this virtual reality thing and you reach out to touch something, you can actually feel it. And uh, guys who've gone to high-tech conferences and tried this stuff out say it is absolutely unbelievable. There's no need to go to a, you know, fly to a meeting in Toronto Everybody is there. You can almost smell them. It's so real. Right. Well, it'll be uh, one of the innovations that shape society going forward, along with likely a driverless car. But, you know, how far and how we are away from that is hard to say. Uh, certainly, um, it'll be one of those uh, 
one of those game changers, uh, but how it impacts the uh, investing world. You know, there's no clear leader yet in that. I mean, Facebook has uh, certainly been investing a lot of um, resources into that area, and I'm sure there are a number of competitors that are doing the same thing. Many are maybe not talking about their plans, so we'll have to we'll have to we'll have to see. One thing that, that may give a it may give a, a second life too is the um, old-fashioned internet cafe, which um, the advent of the tablet kind of went uh, way out of the dodo bird, but uh, you know these uh, 3D uh, uh, computers will be quite expensive initially, so maybe uh, maybe at least uh, breathe a, uh, a new wave of life into in internet cafes. We'll have to see. Right, and if you're using uh, one of those new quantum physics computers that they build in Burnaby, they're ten million dollars a piece. So yeah, <laughs> if you're going to use the high powered uh, a system, they're not cheap. And yet it is the wave of the future. You know, eventually they will be cheap, but how, you know, uh, how long uh, that will take uh, is anyone's guess. You know, these are fairly complicated systems, so uh, it could be, again, this could be a, this could take a lot longer than, than people uh, hope for, but or it could, uh, you know, it could show up quite quickly. Certainly 3D technology has less, um, regulatory impediments than a driverless car. You know, you've got to get all these uh, various uh, government levels uh, on board, and, you know, that's never a fun or quick process. So uh, with 3D uh, computer technology uh, and uh, with, with uh, these types of uh, software innovations, you can usually uh, bring those to market fairly quickly without a lot of uh, government interference so that could be um that, that could be give, give advantage uh, over the driverless car in terms of what what shows up first in nevada they're already using robot semi-trailers where they run a convoy of six or seven vehicles with a human in the last one to be there in case it, something blows a tire and it has to be fixed but otherwise you know they are running the robots and and, and all those uh, absolutely, and all those convoys come to a complete dead stop at the California border. I can assure you of that. And in Tokyo, they're planning to have robot cabs ready for when they host the Olympics. Well, Japan uh, has uh, a definite uh, opportunity to break out of its uh, kind of funk here, uh, economic funk with the Olympics, and I'm sure they'll try and take every opportunity to demonstrate that they've got their their mojo back uh, technologically, and uh, they you know and they should take advantage of their Olympics to do that because not only uh, you know do they need to kind of get out of their demographic uh, uh, the, I'll call it an oppression, you know, but they also have China as a competitor nipping on their heels uh, on the technology side, and they cannot afford to. Uh, be complacent about their uh, leadership on the innovation side in, in Asia. So um, it'll be Tokyo Olympics will probably be quite. An, <laughs> I, I'm predicting it'll be quite a different uh, experience than uh, what people will see in Brazil, but we will see. Well, Brazil is a scary place at the best of times, and uh, a friend of mine's wife is from Brazil, and she just came back from there and said home invasions are endemic. And it's not just rich people who have to worry about it anymore. It's everywhere. And, and they like to hit at 7 o'clock in the morning when you're getting up for breakfast. What a nice way to greet your day. Well, there's certainly at least uh, moving in the right direction politically. There's a lot of work to be done. And, you know, and just finding enough politicians who aren't kind of um, tainted with corruption is going to be, uh, you know, <laughs> probably the, the hard part in and doing a reset there, but uh, at least uh, things seem to be moving in a in a positive uh, direction, and we certainly wish them all the best in in, in kind of reforming their uh, democratic institutions there because uh, it's a great country and uh, it can contribute a lot to the global economy. And uh, you know, hopefully they'll uh, they'll be on a new era fairly soon here. And um, given the vitality of the people in Brazil, you know, they could surprise us uh, quite quickly in terms of. Uh, being back and 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 being a, a leader, but they've got to they've got to uh, certainly clean house uh, politically. It's uh, and uh, fortunately that process seems to be starting. The G seven finance ministers and central bankers are meeting in Japan. Are they going to come up with anything, or is it just going to be the same old, same old? 
Well, they've got to ensure that uh, they they don't devolve devolve into currency wars. And uh, you know, Japan is the most obvious uh, uh, bad bad uh, bad student in the room. Uh, but you know, Canada's not very far behind. We've had a central bank that's uh, basically talked down the currency, and because we're smaller, we've been getting away with it. Um, but uh, you know, this uh, race to the bottom approach by uh, uh, countries is just so misplaced because you're just uh, making in I mean, you're making uh, policy decisions you know uh, picking winners and losers in your in your country uh, on the whim of a central bank there's actually a very uh, interesting piece that was just put out uh, by PIMCO uh, today and uh, Forex Live uh, tweeted it out it was um, uh, by uh, uh, a fellow named uh, uh, Joking Fells and it was titled "The Downside of Central Bank Independence," and his whole point is: Look, you know, these central banks are making decisions that are redistributing income, and they've got to make these major, uh, major uh, decisions whether to, um, you know, print money to pay down government debt, and and you know, these should not be decisions that are made by institutions that aren't accountable. You know, it's one thing to have an independent central bank when you're raising interest rates to fight inflation. It's quite another to have this independent entity deciding who's going to be bailed out by the printing press and who is not. You know, in Japan, you've got the central bank is buying ETFs. Well, what ETF should they be buying? You know, why this ETF and not that ETF? In the, in Europe, you've got the ECB buying corporate debt. Well, which corporate debt? You know, why this issue or not that issue? These are decisions that should be made by bodies that are accountable, if they should be made at all, by the way. Um, I, I personally don't think you, central banks should be in this business, but that's a, a whole other discussion. If you believe that, yes, they should be intervening, they should at least be accountable for who they're giving money to and who they're not. I mean, this is just an outrageous situation where you've got these central banks that are basically deciding who the winners and losers are in society. In Canada, we've had Stephen Polos deciding that, you know, we need a lower dollar, and who pays the price for that? It's the poorest Canadians who have to pay more for food. Well, you know, I think that's wrong. You know, I think that's wrong that you have a central banker who's not accountable uh, to people, only the most in the most indirect sense by having to come to make some appearances before some parliamentary committees, which is usually full of lawyers, by the way, who aren't versed in economics and finance, um, you know, to decide that the poor Canadian, the poorest of Canadians are, are supposed to subsidize the the economic uh, well-being of uh, some export industries. You know, I mean, but these are decisions that have been made in Canada by an unelected. Body, you know, that's the Bank of Canada, and really, it's one person. That's Stephen Polos, who has the the, uh, the ability to pull the trigger on that. So it's uh, it, it's really a situation that I hope our policymakers, you know, spend some attention on instead of you know who got roughed up in the House of Commons the other day. You know, that's fine. You know, let's deal with that. But let's get back to business now. There's some really important issues facing Canada, and can we please move on from these theatrics that are you know that seem to get the political partisans all worked up, but aren't doing much to help uh, really deal with uh, big problems that Canada has right now. Yes, uh, they're calling the Prime Minister's little incident there elbow gate, but perhaps we should take a look at it. I know a lot of ho hockey referees say no blood, no injury. <laughs> exactly. Now let's get let's everybody get back on the ice and start you know solving is important issues for Canadians, and let's drop this now. We've dealt with it. We've Okay, everyone, you know, the Prime Minister has to live with his, the consequences of his actions. He apologized, and, you know, and it's there. everybody can go back and look at that four years from now if they're so inclined. But let's move on and let's get back to business, please, you know, and uh, uh, no hand-wringing anymore, please, from the opposition. Let's start holding the government accountable for its policy decisions and stop, you know, focusing on these distractions because there's some real important issues facing Canada. You know, Andrew McCreef, who, who does it, a weekly show um, on BNN, you know, he on last Friday, he put up a chart that shows uh, over the last two years the growth in restaurant jobs in Canada versus the growth in in manufacturing job, uh, jobs. And it was like an alligator jaws opening. Okay, the gap is widening and widening. And this is the this is where we're going as a country. You know, we're, we're becoming, uh, you know, a, uh, and I would say this is probably as true in B.C. as well, 
We're becoming a country, a service economy country, you know, to uh, a group of very wealthy uh, uh, in individuals and, and, and players. And, you know, the overall economic base of the country is changing and not for the better. You know, when you, when you see that kind of divergence, in the type of job growth we're having, it's really quite, should be quite frightening, particularly any one of the kids who want them to have a bright future in Canada. You know, there's real problems here, so let's get on and start dealing with it and stop, you know, dragging out these uh, distractions, you know, which, you know, politicians feel very comfortable talking about distractions because they don't have to get their minds around tough issues. Well, in Alberta, unemployment went up 3.3% in March compared month to month. McDonald's just announced that they're going to create 1,900 jobs in Alberta. Is that exactly what's happening? Exactly. You know, and so this is a, this is a big issue. We need to be promoting this, you know, the type of jobs that our kids go to school for, right? We have one of the highest uh, educa uh, educated workforces in, in the world. We have a, a great pool of talent. But if we do not have these design jobs, these value added jobs, then where will these, where will these kids go? Where will these software engineers go? They will go to California. They will go, they will go to whatever, they will go to China. You know, they will go to countries that are vibrant and have the opportunities for, to use these skills and the human capital that, that uh, people have been investing in. You know, so we've really got to get a grip on these issues, and this is what we need to be debating, not, you know, who punched who, who elbowed who in the House of Commons. Let's move on from that. Let's, you know, let's, let's put a, you know, let's, we've had our five minutes of, um, you know, of scuffles, uh, but let's get back to playing uh, the policy game and solving these, uh, or at least addressing these really important issues. Ted, how can people find out more about uh, the Insiders uh, Index uh, readjustment? Uh, go to our uh, CanadianInsider.com website and our Soundbite blog. We have the, the uh, latest uh, allocation discussion about how uh, mining is uh, uh, the big winner this time around. And um, CanadianInsider.com, it's a free website, and uh, you can take a look at the blog right there. Thanks a lot for chatting with us. Thanks for having me. My guest has been Ted Dixon, CEO and co-founder of IncResearch.ca, Canada's first online financial news and research service. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio. Find us on Twitter at TalkDigitalNet. Our popular YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. Comments can be sent to info at HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Thanks for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com Radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com, HowStreet.com Radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.